Helen's Babies, Part Six. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Helen's Babies by John Haberton, Part Six. Uncle Harry said, "Budge, 'twas real good of the Lord to let you be with us, else Toddy might have drowned." Yes, said I, and I shouldn't have much. Ock and Howie cried Toddy, running impetuously toward me, pulling me down, and patting my cheek with his muddy black hand. I loves you for taking me out de water. I accept your apology, said I, but let's hurry home. There was but one residence to pass, and that, thank fortune, was so densely screened by shrubbery that the inmates could not see the road. To be sure, we were on a favorite driving road, but we could reach home in five minutes, and we might dodge into the woods if we heard a carriage coming. Ha! There came a carriage already, and we. Was there ever a sorrier looking group? There were ladies in the carriage, too. Could it be? Of course it was. Did the evil spirit which guided those children always send an attendant for Miss Mayton before he began operations? There she was, anyway, cool, neat. Dainty, trying to look collected, but severely flushed by the attempt. It was of no use to drop my eyes, for she had already recognized me, so I turned to her a face which I think must have been just the one, unless more defiant, that I carried into two or three cavalry charges. You seem to have been having a real good time together, said she, with a conventional smile as the carriage passed. Remember, you're all going to call on me tomorrow afternoon. Bless the girl! Her heart was as quick as her eyes. Almost any other young lady would have devoted her entire energy to laughing on such an occasion, but she took her earliest opportunity to make me feel at ease. Such a royal hearted woman deserves to. I caught myself just here, with my cheeks growing quite hot under the mud Toddy had put on them, and I led our retreat with a more stylish carriage than my appearance could possibly have warranted. And then I consigned my nephews to the maid, with very much the air of an officer turning over a large number of prisoners he had captured. I hastily changed my soiled clothing for my best, not that I expected to see any one, but because of a sudden increase in the degree of respect I felt toward myself. When the children were put to bed, and I had no one but my thoughts for companions, I spent a delightful hour or two in imagining as possible some changes. Of which I had never dared to think before. On Monday morning I was in the garden at sunrise. Toddy was to carry his expiatory bouquet to Miss Mayton that day, and I proposed that no pains should be spared to make his atonement as handsome as possible. I canvassed carefully every border, bed, and detached flowering plant until I had as accurate an idea of their possibilities. As if I had inventoried the flowers in pen and ink. This done, I consulted the servant as to the unsoiled clothing of my nephews. She laid out their entire wardrobe for my inspection, and after a rigid examination of everything, I selected the suits which the boys were to wear in the afternoon. Then I told the girl that the boys were going with me after dinner to call on some ladies, and that I desired that she should wash and dress them carefully. Tell me just what time you'll start, sir, and I'll begin an hour beforehand, said she. That's the only way to be sure that they don't disgrace you. For breakfast we had, among other things, some stewed oysters served in soup plates. Oh, Todd! shrieked Budge. There's the turtle plates again. Oh, ain't I glad! Oh, e turtle plates! squealed Toddy. What on earth do you mean, boys? I demanded. I'll show you, said Budge, jumping down from his chair and bringing his plate of oysters cautiously toward me. Now you just put your head down underneath my plate and look up, and you'll see a turtle. For a moment I forgot that I was not at a restaurant, and I took the plate, held it up, and examined its bottom. There, said Budge, pointing to the trademark in colors of the makers of the crockery. Don't you see the turtle? I abruptly ordered Budge to his seat, unmoved even by Toddy's remark that, Dey ish turtles, but dey can't quall around like other turtles. 
After breakfast I devoted a great deal of fussy attention to myself. Never did my own wardrobe seem so meagre and ill-assorted. Never did I cut myself so many times while shaving. Never did I use such unsatisfactory shoe-polish. I finally gave up in despair my effort to appear genteel, and devoted myself to the bouquet. I cut almost flowers enough to dress a church, and then remorselessly excluded every one which was in the least particular imperfect. In making the bouquet I enjoyed the benefit of my nephew's assistance and counsel, and took enforced part in conversation which flowers suggested. "'Ockin' Howie,' said Toddy, "'ish heaven all like this, with pretty flowers, "'cause I don't see what the angels ever turns out for if tis.' "'Uncle Harry,' said Budge, "'when the leaves all go up and down and wriggle around so, "'are they talking to the wind?' "'I—I I guess so, old fellow.' "'Who are you making that bouquet for, Uncle Harry?' asked Budge. "'For a lady, for Miss Mayton, the lady that saw us all muddy yesterday afternoon,' said I. "'Oh, I like her,' said Budge. "'She looks so nice and pretty, just like a cake, just as if she was good to eat. "'Oh, I just love her, don't you?' "'Well, I respect her very highly, Budge.' "'Spect? What does spect mean?' "'Why, it means that I think she's a lady, a real pleasant lady, just the nicest sort of lady in the world, the sort of person I'd like to see every day, and like to see her better than anyone else.' "'Oh, why, spect and love means just the same thing, don't they, Uncle Her— "'Budge,' I exclaimed, somewhat hastily, "'run ask Maggie for a piece of string, quick.' "'All right,' said Budge, moving off. "'But they do, don't they?' At two o'clock I instructed Maggie to dress my nephews, and at three we started to make our call. To carry Toddy's bouquet and hold a hand of each boy, so as to keep them from darting into the hedges for grasshoppers and the gutters for butterflies was no easy work, but I managed to do it. As we approached Mrs. Clarkson's boarding-house I felt my hat was over one ear and my cravat awry, but there was no opportunity to rearrange them for I saw Alice Mayton on the piazza, and felt that she saw me. Handing the bouquet to Toddy, and promising him three sticks of candy if he would be careful and not drop it, we entered the garden. The moment we were inside the hedge, and Toddy saw a man going over the grass with a lawn-mower, he shrieked, "'Oh, there's a cutter-grass!' and dropped the bouquet with a carelessness born of perfect ecstasy. I snatched it before it reached the ground, dragged the offending youth up the walk, saluted Miss Mayton, and told Toddy to give the bouquet to the lady. This he succeeded in doing, but as Miss Mayton thanked him and stooped to kiss him, he wriggled off the piazza like a little eel, shouted, "'Tum on!' to his brother, and a moment later my nephews were following the cutter-grass at a respectful distance in the rear. "'Those are my sister's best children in the world, Miss Mayton,' said I. "'Bless the little darlings,' replied the lady. "'I do love to see children enjoying themselves.' "'So do I,' said I, "'when I'm not responsible for their well-being. "'But if the effort I've expended on those boys "'had been directed toward the interests of my employers, "'those worthy gentlemen would consider me invaluable.' "'Miss Mayton made some witty reply, "'and we settled to a pleasant chat about mutual acquaintances.' about books, pictures, music, and the gossip of our set. I would cheerfully have discussed Herbert Spencer's system, the Assyrian tablets, or any other dry subject with Miss Mayton, and felt that I was richly repaid by the pleasure of seeing her. Handsome, intelligent, composed, tastefully dressed, without a suspicion of the flirt or the languid woman of fashion about her, she awakened to the uttermost every admiring sentiment and every manly feeling. But, alas, my enjoyment was probably more than I deserved, so it was cut short. There were other ladies boarding at Mrs. Clarkson's, and as Miss Mayton truthfully observed at our first meeting, men were very scarce at Hillcrest. So the ladies, by the merest accident, of course, happened upon the piazza, and each one was presented to me, and common civility made it impossible for me to speak to Miss Mayton more than once in ten minutes. At any other time and place, I should have found the meeting of so many ladies a delightful experience, but now— 
Suddenly a compound shriek arose from the lawn, and all the ladies sprang to their feet. I followed their example, setting my teeth firmly and viciously, hoping that whichever nephew had been hurt was badly hurt. We saw Toddy running toward us with one hand in his mouth, while Budge ran beside him, exclaiming, "'Poor little Toddy, don't cry. Does it hurt you awful? Never mind. Uncle Harry'll comfort you. Don't cry, Toddy, dear.' Both boys reached the piazza steps and clambered up, Budge exclaiming, "'Oh, Uncle Harry, Toddy put his fingers in the little wheels of the cuttergrass, and it turned just the least little bitty, and it hurted him.' But Toddy ran up to me, clasped my legs, and sobbed, "'Sink Toddy one boy day!' My blood seemed to freeze. I could have choked that dreadful child, suffering though he was. I stooped over him, caressed him, promised him candy, took out my watch, and gave it to him to play with, but he returned to his original demand. A lady, the homeliest in the party, suggested that she should bind up his hand, and I inwardly blessed her, but he reiterated his request for Toddy One Boy Day, and sobbed pitifully. "'What does he mean?' asked Miss Mayton. "'He wants Uncle Harry to sing Charlie Boy one day,' explained Budge. "'He always wants that song when he's hurt anyway.' "'Oh, do sing it to him, Mr. Burton,' pleaded Miss Mayton, and all the other ladies exclaimed, "'Oh, do!' I wrathfully picked him up in my arms and hummed the air of the detested song. "'Sit in a walkin' chair!' sobbed Toddy. I obeyed, and then my tormentor remarked, "'You don't sing the wides!' words. "'I wants the wides!' I sang the words as softly as possible, with my lips close to his ear, but he roared, "'Sing louder!' "'I don't know any more of it, Toddy,' I exclaimed in desperation. "'Oh, I'll tell it all to you, Uncle Harry,' said Budge. "'And there, before that audience, and her,' I was obliged to sing that dreadful doggerel, line for line, as Budge repeated it. My teeth were set tight, my brow grew clammy, and I gazed upon Toddy with terrible thoughts in my mind. No one laughed. I grew so desperate that a titter would have given relief. At last I heard some one whisper, "'See how he loves him, poor man. He's in perfect agony over the little fellow.' Had not the song reached its natural end just then, I believe I should have tossed my wounded nephew over the piazza rail. As it was, I set him upon his feet, announced the necessity of our departure, and began to take leave, when Miss Mayton's mother insisted that we should stay to dinner. "'For myself I should be delighted, Mrs. Mayton,' said I, "'but my nephews have hardly learned company manners yet. I'm afraid my sister wouldn't forgive me if she heard I had taken them out to dinner.' "'Oh, I'll take care of the little dears,' said Miss Mayton. "'They'll be good with me, I know.' "'I couldn't be so unkind as to let you try it, Miss Mayton,' I replied. But she insisted, and the pleasure of submitting to her will was so great that I would have risked even greater mischief. So Miss Mayton sat down to dinner with Budge upon one side and Toddy on the other, while I was fortunately placed opposite— from which position I could indulge in warning winks and frowns. The soup was served. I signalled the boys to tuck their napkins under their chins, and then turned to speak to the lady on my right. She politely inclined her head toward me, but her thoughts seemed elsewhere. Following her eyes, I beheld my youngest nephew with his plate upraised in both hands, his head on the tablecloth, and his eyes turned painfully upward. I dared not speak, for fear he would drop the plate. Suddenly he withdrew his head, put on an angelic smile, tilted his plate so part of its contents sought refuge in the fold of Miss Mayton's dainty snowy dress, while the offender screamed, "'Oh, oui, je turtle on my plate, Budgie, je turtle on my plate!' Budge was about to raise the plate when he caught my eye, and desisted. Poor Miss Mayton actually looked discomposed for the first time in her life, so far as I knew or could imagine. She recovered quickly, however, and treated that wretched boy with the most Christian forbearance and consideration during the remainder of the meal. 
When the dessert was finished, she quickly excused herself, while I removed Toddy to a secluded corner of the piazza, and favored him with a lecture which caused him to howl pitifully, and compelled me to caress him and undo all the good which my rebukes had done. Then he and Budge removed themselves to the lawn, while I awaited Miss Mayton's reappearance, to offer an apology for Toddy, and to make our adieus. It was the custom of the ladies at Mrs. Clarkson's to stroll about the lovely rural walks after dinner, and until twilight, and on this particular evening they departed in twos and threes, leaving me to make my apology without witnesses. I was rather sorry they went. It was not pleasant to feel that I was principally responsible for my nephew's blunder, and to have no opportunity to allay my conscience pangs by conversation. It seemed to me Miss Mayton was forever in appearing. I even called up my nephews to have some one to talk to. Suddenly she appeared, and in an instant I fervently blessed Toddy and the soup which the child had sent upon its aimless wanderings. I would rather pay the price of a fine dress than try to describe Miss Mayton's attire. I can only say that in style, color, and ornament it became her perfectly, and set off the beauties of a face which I had never before thought was more than pleasing and intelligent. Perhaps the anger which was excusable after Toddy's graceless caper had something to do with putting unusual color into her cheeks, and a brighter sparkle than usual in her eyes. Whatever was the cause, she looked queenly, and I half imagined that I detected in her face a gleam of satisfaction at the involuntary start which her unexpected appearance caused me to make. She accepted my apology for Toddy with queenly graciousness, and then, instead of proposing that we should follow the other ladies, as a moment before I had hoped she would, she dropped into a chair. I accepted the invitation. The children should have been in bed half an hour before, but my sense of responsibility had departed when Miss Mayton appeared. The little scamps were safe until they should perform some new and unexpected act of impishness. They retired to one end of the piazza, and busied themselves in experiments upon a large Newfoundland dog, while I, the happiest man alive, talked to the glorious woman before me, and enjoyed the spectacle of her radiant beauty. The twilight came and deepened, but imagination prevented the vision from fading. With the coming of the darkness and the starlight, our voices unconsciously dropped to lower tones, and her voice seemed purest music. And yet we said nothing which all the world might not have listened to without suspecting a secret. The ladies returned in little groups, but either out of womanly intuition, or in answer to my unspoken but fervent prayers, passed us and went into the house. I was affected by an odd mixture of desperate courage and despicable cowardice. I determined to tell her all, yet I shrank from the task with more terror than ever befell me in the first steps of a charge. Suddenly a small shadow came from behind us, and stood between us, and the voice of Budge remarked, "'Uncle Harry specs you, Miss Mayton.' "'Suspects me? Of what, pray?' exclaimed the lady, patting my nephew's cheek. Budge, said I, I feel that my voice rose nearly to a scream. Budge, I must beg of you to respect the sanctity of confidential communications. What is it, Budge? persisted Miss Mayton. You know the old adage, Mr. Burton, children and fools speak the truth. Of what does he suspect me, Budge? Tain't suspect at all, said Budge. It's aspect. Expect? echoed Miss Mayton. No, not X. It's aspect. I know all about it, cause I ask him. Aspect is what folks do when they think you're nice and like to talk to you, and— Respect is what the boy is trying to say, Miss Mayton, I interrupted, to prevent what I feared might follow. Budge has a terrifying faculty for asking questions, and the result of some of them this morning was my endeavor to explain to him the nature of the respect in which gentlemen hold ladies. Yes, continued Budge, I know all about it, only Uncle Harry don't say it right. What he calls aspect, I calls love. End of section six. Read by Kara Schallenberg on January 25th, 2008. 
in San Diego, California.